Good morning and welcome to BFC Live. My name is Ben Bumpus and I am one of the pastors here at Bethany First Church. And BFC Live is the place to hear inspiring stories and important updates about all the things that are going on in our wonderful and beautiful community that you are a part of. One of my favorite parts about BFC Live is the incredible guest we bring on each week to share with us things that are going on in that story and in that community. And we would love to hear from a special guest today, Pastor Terry Cobb. Terry, we are so glad to have you here. Well, thank you, Ben. Glad to be here. Of course. So, Terry, we have a couple things going on at BFC yep. right now, and you are a part of a couple different ministries between BFC and Two Lakes, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's awesome. And I'd love to specifically hear about Celebrate Recovery today. Would you All mind right. telling us a little about Absolutely. what God's up to there? Absolutely. I love Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery at BFC has been going on for the last 16 years, and it is kind of a full, uh, full holistic approach to family recovery. We have... Um, it's a 12-step study that includes small groups. Most people think that Celebrate Recovery is about addictions, drugs, and alcohol, but only a third of our people actually uh, involved in that. And so we have people who are in recovery for anxiety, depression, grief, a lot of different things because hurts lead to habit, lead to hangups, and hangups lead to habits. And so we trust Jesus to get us through these hurts, hangups, and habits. Now it is a holistic approach. So we begin to serve dinner at 5:30 on Tuesday evenings. We uh, have our adult program has large group and small group, but the children uh, we have nursery up through pre uh, through kindergarten, and then we have children's program. We have the landing. We have vetted children's workers. It's really a holistic approach to recovery for people. It's a it's an exciting ministry. Every Tuesday evening, you'll want to be there. That is incredible. It is so cool to see what the Lord is up to. Where two or three gather, there he is with us. And that is awesome. Thank you for that update, yep. Pastor Terry. Hey, we are passionate about connection here yep. at BFC, Amen. not just with God, but also with you. So there's going to be a QR code popping up on the screen. We would love for you to scan that. You can fill out prayer requests there that you have, or if you're interested in taking your next steps in your walk with Jesus, you can fill out that thing that pops up when you scan that QR code and a pastor will get back to you this week. Maybe myself, maybe Pastor Terry, maybe Brent Hardesty, maybe Ashley Lauder. I don't know. Some, somebody will. We'll get back to you this week about that card that you fill out. So we'd love for you to do that. You can also keep up with us on all of our social medias, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. I know a couple of our ministries have their own social media pages, like BFC Youth, for example. I'm a little partial to that yes, one. Yes, you are. Uh, also, our preteen has their own, our preteen ministry has their own social account where they're posting about a trip coming up. Pastor Terry, right. you know a little about that, don't you? A little bit. Pastor Corey and her staff of volunteers are going to be taking our preteens to Camp Bond on November 10th through 12th for their fall retreat. It's an uh, awesome opportunity for them to get together, to draw closer to Christ, and to also draw closer to one another. A lot of good fun and fellowship there. If you need more information on that, you can con you can look up our website at BFC, or you can go to the BFC Preteen Instagram account. There you go. Absolutely. It's going to be an incredible trip, and we're excited to see it. Yep. Today is Baptism Sunday, so we are super, super excited about that, to see people taking their next steps Amen. in their faith walk with Jesus and declaring the goodness and the saving grace that He has had in their lives. And That's we are right. so excited as pastors and as a church family to be able to walk through that with them. I know I'm excited, I'm Pastor excited Terry. I'm excited, too. So today is also a time where we are going to continue in our series called uh, Way, Truth, and Life. Pastor uh, Rick Harvey almost forgot his name there for a second, our own pastor. <laughs> Pastor is going to lead us in, in that. So we are super excited to continue that series. I know it's going to be an incredible service with yep. incredible worship, which we're going to go ahead and lean into now. So please join us in worship. Good morning. So wonderful to see you all here today. We'd like to invite you to stand if you would. 
And let's worship the Lord with all that we have today. Amen. We crown him because he is on the throne. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we crown him with many crowns today. Join together and sing praise to him. Let's sing together. Crown him with many crowns. to praise the Lord. Amen. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but rather the grace of God that is within me. First Corinthians 15, 10, a reminder of his great and marvelous grace that we get to celebrate today. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. 
Aren't you thankful that God looked beyond all of our faults, our sins, and he saw how needy we were for forgiveness and for grace? In Romans 5, 3, Paul says it this way, God demonstrates his own love for us like this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. So here you are this morning. You're hearing about God's grace. And in a moment, I'm going to share with you from God's word about his grace when I preach. And maybe some of you have walked in the door for one of the first times this morning. What we're talking about is real. So many of us have experienced it. We want to walk with you in this journey of grace. Under your armrest, there's a connect card. If this is one of your first Sundays, I, I can't tell you how desperately I want you to fill it out. We would love to know your name. We'd love to give you a call. We'd love to ask you, how can we help you take next steps in this journey of grace? We want you to join us. It's also one of those days where... Um, We've been praying for countries around the world. We've been praying for Ukraine for some time. We've been praying for Israel. We've been praying for the people in Gaza. It's on days like today that I'm very thankful that um, we've got people who have served our country. Are you thankful for those people? As a nation, we'll celebrate veterans this week, and this morning I want to pray for those nations, and I want to pray for our nation. we got some people here who have been marching in another army, uh, Rob and Colleen Hintz. They have served as missionaries in the Philippines, South Korea, New Zealand. They'll be leaving uh, in November. Would you stand, Rob and Colleen? Are you near me right here? Can we just welcome them this morning? They have family here. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. You can catch us online starting in November. Yeah. Father, that you could look beyond our faults. And by your grace, you saw how needy we are. It's why we can't take our eyes off the cross. It's why our hearts are flooded with gratitude and thanksgiving. We are grateful for your love and for your grace, for your forgiveness, for restoring us in our relationship with the Father. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We pray for what's going on in Ukraine. We pray for what's going on in the Middle East today. And we pray for these United States of America, Lord, today. We give you thanks for people who have served this country. We're praying for revival in this nation. We're praying for a turning to you. And I believe we're at a place, Lord, where people are tired and concerned about the direction of our nation. And we know that you're the answer. Save this land, I pray. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
so this is Time Change Sunday. Do you realize what it means for us here today? It means I get to preach an extra hour. You might want to settle in. It's going to be a while. No, I'm teasing. I would not do that to you. I was on the phone yesterday with a friend who had had a, um, a very risky heart procedure done the day before, and I called to check on him and see how he was doing. And uh, he said to me in the conversation, he said, I said to my family before the procedure, you know, if I don't come through it, it's Okay. And then he tried to say something and became a little bit emotional on the phone. And he paused for a minute. And then he says these words. I don't know how I could be any more ready. Wow. So a doctor is being up front with you. And he's telling you you're going to have a procedure. And it could go south. Would your response be, it's okay? I don't know how I could be any more ready than I am to die, to leave this world. That's confidence, isn't it? Here's the question. What is the confidence in? I remember listening to a preacher preach a sermon a few years ago online, and he said over and over and over again through the sermon, Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And I've often thought, what would it be like if you lived your whole life trying to be good enough Hoping that maybe when you came to the end of this life, that God would look you in the eye and say, well, it was close, but you were good enough. Come on in. We've been studying a book together called Way, Truth, and Life, Discipleship as a Journey of Grace by Dr. David Busick. And Dr. Busick says something profound in the book in chapter 4 on saving grace. I hope you've bought the book. If you haven't, I hope you're buying the book. I hope you're reading along with me. He says this. He says, we are saved by grace. So that whole thing about being good enough is out the window. We are saved by grace, and grace comes from outside ourselves. Grace is not based on my own actions. Grace is a gift that God gives me. I'm saved by grace, and you got to understand that grace comes from outside of me. And so my salvation is not based on my good works. And so what I'd love to do is take you back to Ephesians. You remember last Sunday I said we're going to come back to this passage. So we are back today at this passage, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, I'll be reading verses 8. 9 and 10 this morning. Last week, I read these words. You were dead. Paul says, you remember when I came to you? He had spent two years in Ephesus as a missionary. Many people began a journey with Jesus because of his ministry. Years later, he's in prison, and he writes this letter to them. And he says, do you remember? You remember when I came to you? You were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. Spiritually, you were dead. You followed the ways of the world. You followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You gratified the cravings of your flesh. But God, who is rich in mercy, raised us with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. You remember your story? When you get to verse 8, 9, and 10, he talks very specifically about how a person experiences saving grace. Let me share the words with you, okay? This is how a person comes to Jesus. This is how a person experiences saving grace. For it is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith. Listen carefully. And this is not from yourselves. You remember grace comes outside ourself? It is the gift of God. So it's not something we earn by good works. It's clearly a gift. 
Not by works, he says clearly, so that nobody can boast. I can never come to this place that says, I worked really hard, I was a really good person, I became good enough that God finally said, okay, Rick, that's good enough, I will save you. That's not it. We are God's handiwork. It is all God's work in us, drawing us to himself, speaking to us, loving us, wooing us, giving us faith to respond to him, transforming us, changing us. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. I was looking for participation. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? I'm not saved because of my good works, but now that I'm saved, I am able to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God, and the people said, thanks be to God. I remember years ago, might have been nine, ten years ago, I called my friend Carter and I said, I've got an idea and I wish it could be more visible. And I know it's Friday afternoon and Sunday's only a couple of days away, but I wish you would build me something because I want people to be able to see and so the other day, I opened a closet door in the office, and laying on the top shelf was that item that Carter had built for me. And I brought it with me today because I don't think there's anything that makes the point more clearly than this. So you can imagine that this is a um, kind of a kind of scale, and, um, and scales obviously weigh and balance and all those kinds of things. Um, once in a while, I talk to somebody, and they say to me, um, Rick, in fact, I'll tell you a specific example. I answered my phone one day, and the person on the other end of the phone said, Pastor Rick, and I said, yeah. And his next words were, I should go to hell for how I've lived my life these last three days. What he was really saying to me was, I've stacked up a lot of bad. If these blocks represent bad or sin or evil, he was saying, this is what is stacking up in my life these days. And I'm tilted this way. I should go to hell for how I've lived my life these last three days. Once in a while, I talk to other people, and their stories are very different. And they're saying, you know what? Um, I had this opportunity to serve, and I've been serving. I had an opportunity to give. I've been giving. I had an opportunity to do the right thing. I was called in a space, and I, and I chose to go with God. And they've just been stacking up the good, and the scales are tilted in, in that direction. Once in a while, it's more like this. A person may say, you know, <clears throat> I, uh, I've done some bad, yeah, but I've also done some good. Kind of balances it out, right? And I know that I keep doing wrong, but uh, you know what? I, I always look for those opportunities to kind of balance that out and, and, and do some good, too. So I've, I've done both. And I know that wasn't right, what happened the other day, but, you know, I also gave a little shot in the offering when I got to church that Sunday. And so I, I'm not living like God would want me to, but I, I sure try to balance it some. There, there's an ideology called moralism. Do you know what moralism is? Moralism would say, um, yeah, uh, for sure in my life, you know, I've, I've done some, some wrong. I mean, I admit, you know, I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. I, I sin, but, um, you know, also try to do some good too. And uh, then there's more wrong, but uh, there's more good, you know. And, and the person who is interested in moralism would say, I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, to balance the scale. What I'm trying to do is um, tip the scale in my favor. I want more good than bad. And, and if I can do more good than bad, if I can get more in the good column than I can get in the bad column, maybe it'll tip the scale in my favor. And God will say, well, it was close, but uh, I think it was good enough. In fact, Dr. Busick says, moralism, a moralist is someone who believes they are saved by the good they do and the bad that they avoid. You don't need to appear puzzled. 
Because more of us than want to admit it, understand it. We are all tempted toward that kind of thinking. I'm going to let myself slip, but I'll try to stack more over here. However, I read to you from Scripture this morning, God's Word, and I'm going to cite the words to you again. We have been saved by grace, not by works. I want to talk to you about sin. Paul said, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. I want to talk to you about the atonement, a theological word. And I want to talk to you about how a person experiences saving grace. You ready? So let's start with sin. There's a story that I try to repeat as often as I can, wherever I can. And here's the story. A little girl was one day headed over to her grandmother's house to spend the night. To get to her grandmother's house, she had to cross over a mountain trail up and back down. And as she's on that trail by herself, walking to her grandmother's house along the mountain path, the trail, um, she's startled. She jumps back because she sees laying in the path a snake. And the snake says, I didn't mean to startle you. And the little girl said, well, why wouldn't you startle me? You're a snake. And the snake said, oh, I, I hate it that you have that opinion of me. The snake said, I have a lot of good qualities, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm beautiful. Look at, my, look at my colors as I, they glisten in the sunlight. Let me move just slightly and you can see. And the little girl said, well, your colors and your shapes are quite pretty. And the snake said, where are you headed? Grandmother's house at the foot of the mountain trail. Oh, you'll have no trouble getting there by nighttime. <laughs> Wish it were the case for me. I'm slower than you are. You, you, you don't think maybe you could, no, I shouldn't ask, uh, what? You wouldn't consider giving me a ride, would you? Oh, I, I don't think I should do that. You're a snake. No, all, all it would be is just if you sat down on the rock, I would slither into your pocket and you could just give me a lift down the mountain trail. I wouldn't hurt you, I promise. You promise, yes. Well, I guess it wouldn't hurt. And the little girl sits down on the rock, and the snake goes into her pocket, and three steps down the path, the snake bites her in the side. And she pulls the snake out and throws it back onto the path and says, you lied to me. And before the snake slithers off into the bushes, he says to the little girl, you knew what I was when you picked me up. I remember telling that story to a group of college students, adults in a degree completion program, teaching a course at one of our universities. And I said, what do you think about the story? I remember vividly a lady raised her hand and I said, yes. And she said, I hate the story. I said, why do you hate the story? She says, it's my story. I said, it's everybody's story. The enemy is deceiving. He is cunning. He's a liar. And he tempts us toward sin. So what is sin? I'm going to give you a good definition of sin, okay? It's a good Wesleyan definition. Why do you think it's a Wesleyan definition, Rick? Because Wesley wrote it. John Wesley says sin is a voluntary transgression of a known law of God. Study it for a minute. A voluntary transgression. I know that God says it's wrong, but I'm choosing to do it anyway. I know what God wants. I know what God thinks. I know what God says. But I will go against what God thinks, knows, and says, and I will do what I want to do. It's, it's in essence what all sin is about. It's when I say to God, scoot over, I'm going to drive. I'm going to be in charge of my own life. I'm going to do what I want to do. 
a voluntary transgression of a known law of God. And so in light of that, sin, let me show you the next slide, is actually one of the words we'll use is rebellion. I know where you are, God, on this, but I'm not going to follow you on this. I'm going to do what I want to do, is to rebel against God. Another word, and Dr. Busick, I wish you would buy the book because you would love this section of the, of the chapter. He says it's also enslavement. So let's think about rebellion. Adam and Eve looks at the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree that God said, don't eat from this tree. They said, well, the fruit on that tree is pleasing to the eye, and it looks like to me it would taste good. And Eve says, I'm going to eat the fruit, and Adam says, I'm going to also. After God clearly said, don't. So that's rebellion. Because of the decision, we are all fallen. And as fallen people, we are not free to do what we want to do. We are captives of sin. I can't tell you how many times somebody's had a conversation with me as their pastor saying, Pastor Rick, I've told myself over and over again, I don't want to keep doing it, but I keep doing it. I try to stop and I can't. So not only is it enslavement, it's, it's also estrangement. It separates me from God and sin also separates me from others. So God is there. I'm here God has always been there, but there's something between us. I don't even want to try to pray or talk to God because there's something between us. The relationship's not right, and what's between us is my sin. And there are many, many people in the room this morning who would say, and I understand it's separating me from others. I can tell you a story about my sin separating me from somebody else. It's estrangement. So, sin is an issue. So let's, let's talk about this, okay? Um, the Bible teaches us that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. Now, the theological term to talk about that is atonement. In a minute and a half, I want you to lean in, and I want you to buy the book. I'll quit saying it. In the Old Testament, Yom Kippur, atonement, the holiest day of the year, was the day that people dealt with Repentance and forgiveness. Here's how it worked. The high priest would bring a goat forward and they would slaughter the goat on the altar. The blood would be spilled. A sacrifice was made to atone for the sins of the people. This is the day of atonement. There was a second goat. It was not killed. The priest would confess all the sins of the people over the head of the goat. In other words, all the sins were placed on the head of the goat. Then the goat was sent out into the wilderness to be out of sight. The goat carried their sins away. Jesus' death on the cross becomes both the sacrifice and the scapegoat. Our sins have been covered. That's why I grew up singing. They are covered by the blood. Atonement means to cover over. They have been carried away. Jesus' death on the cross provides atonement for our sins. So how does saving grace work? How does one become a Christian? Let me give you three words, okay? Grace, faith, and good works. Paul gives it to us in this order for a reason. The order is important, okay? So let's talk about grace. We've talked already about the fact that salvation is a gift. I can't earn it. It's not about how much good I can stack up. And if I can stack up more good than I can stack up bad, then maybe I can be good enough. And God will say, okay, good enough. You can get into heaven. No, it's a gift. It's grace. We talked last week about how we are spiritually dead. Dead people can't act. God comes all the way to where we are. He awakens our spiritual senses. It's prevenient grace. He begins to speak to us and draw us. He gives us the grace to respond. That's called faith. I now believe that Jesus can save me. I now believe that Jesus can forgive me of my sins. Grace leads to faith, but faith leads to, leads to good works. Now, I'm not saved by my good works, but because I have been saved, good works flow out of my life. So here's what it looks like in a nutshell. Let me give you the next slide. It's a gift from God. We give given grace to trust in him. We accept his forgiveness of our sins. 
Our guilt, our shame are gone, and our relationship with God is restored. Anybody here this morning who would say, Rick, I want to experience saving grace. I want to be forgiven. I want all the shame and all the guilt to be gone. I want the fear to be gone. I want to know there's nothing between me and God. I want to see him as a friend. And you may say, he's been talking to me. What you talked about last week, my goodness, he's talking to me. He's been talking to me ever since I got in the room this morning. He won't quit talking to me. He's talking to me through you. And I'm ready today to begin a journey with Jesus. I, I would love us to all bow our heads. And those of you who are already on a journey with Jesus, I want you to pray for those who are not yet on the journey with Jesus. And if this morning you have been contemplating, you've been thinking, God's been speaking to you, and you have a desire to experience saving grace, I want this morning you to pray with me. If you're ready to do this and you're sincere and you're saying, I'm ready, Rick, to walk with Jesus now. And so you would pray a prayer that goes something like this. You can borrow my words if you want. God, I admit that I have sinned. I'm a sinner. I know that there's been times in my life when it was very clear to me what you wanted, and I went the other way. And, and I confess that Jesus has the power. I put my faith in. I believe that you can forgive me and save me and make me right with God. And I confess Jesus is Lord of my life. With the grace you'll give me, God, I will follow you with every day that I have left. This morning, I want to say to you that if you prayed that prayer, I would love for you to... Um, take the next step. I think the next step is telling somebody, like a pastor, a friend, but somebody will help you take the next step. Not just to tell them, but to help you take the next step. The next step for many is Christian baptism. So this morning we have 14 people who are being baptized. I'd love to show you their pictures because they're not all in this service. You can see them on the screen. And they will be this morning doing several things. They will be um, accepting the atonement that Jesus has provided for their sins. They'll be identifying with Jesus and his death when they're dunked into the water, his resurrection when they come out of the water. They acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They're making a commitment to follow Jesus all the days of their lives. They are identifying with the church, saying, this is our family. We welcome them this morning into the household of God. And this is a sacred sacrament. It's a outward sign of inward grace, but it's not just a sign. It's not just a declaration of my faith because we believe it's a means of grace. God does something in the moment. In other words, something happens in the water. Amen? So I wanted to offer you an opportunity today as well. Maybe you didn't sign up to be baptized today, but maybe you prayed that prayer with me this morning. Or maybe recently you've said yes to Jesus and you've not been baptized. And God's word calls us to repent and be baptized. And so this morning as we begin, if you want to stand to your feet and if you want to go to the southeast lobby, there are four doors to my right. There will be a pastor there to help you and we have the clothing that you would need. If you have made a decision, if you have said yes to Jesus, if you've responded to his love for you, and you are now following Jesus, but you've not yet been baptized, I would invite you this morning to join us in this baptism. In fact, you may say, I don't know for sure. A pastor will be there to help you know for sure. 
So I'm grateful to worship with you this morning and celebrate what God is doing in the lives of these people that we're going to baptize. Amen? Amen. Stand if you would. Who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, his free. excited this morning that 14 people are being baptized? And I'm going to say it's okay to express that excitement when they come out of the water. I think we should celebrate with them. If somebody doesn't go home hoarse, I'm going to be disappointed. Okay? So coming into the water for baptism this morning is Emery McCamey. Emery is a precious, precious little girl. And... Um, we're going to get lights on there. She is. Good morning, Emery. Can you see me? Yeah? 
You can wave back if you can. Yeah. Emory says, one night, talking to my dad before bed, we knelt beside the bed, and I asked Jesus into my heart. When I talk to God, I thank him for the life he's given me. He's given you a good life, girl, a great family, his love. I wish your grandpa was here today, your other grandpa. I pray for my friends and my family. I want to give grace to others by forgiving and loving them like Jesus did me. It's a great word. And so, Emery, you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Emery, as you are anointed with the oil this morning, receive the grace and the healing of our Lord Jesus. May the power of the Holy Spirit work within you that you will be a faithful witness of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is Camp Shen. And Camp says, I was home talking with my mom, and I prayed, and I asked Jesus into my heart. I want to show people that I belong to Jesus and that he is really the Lord of my life. I'm proud of you, Champ. And this morning, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let's celebrate with Champ Shin this morning. Champ, receive the grace and the healing of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the holy power of the Holy Spirit work within you that you may be a faithful witness of Jesus. Amen. So this is Sawyer rushing and Sawyer will be baptized by Mike Brooks. And Sawyer says, listen to this, I'm being baptized today because Jesus called me to be washed and reborn of water and spirit as is written in John's gospel. This is my public declaration of my dedication as a servant of God's kingdom now and as long as I live. I love it, Sawyer, I'm proud of you. You are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sawyer, receive the grace and healing of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit work within you that, may, that you may be a faithful witness of Jesus. Amen. Great. So Steve Rains is joining me at this time. Oh, I love Steve's story. I've been able to spend a little time with him. And uh, his words are from the heart. And I want to wait till he gets with me until I read them to you right here. Steve says, after a lifetime of hyper self-dependence, <laughs> that's honesty, I'm turning my life over to God completely. Jesus is leading me into a life of abundance through love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And I haven't experienced this, Steve says, in quite some time. I've become more focused on these things, and I want to serve and follow him. And so, Steve, this morning, if you'll bend your head forward, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Steve Rains, receive the grace and the healing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the power of the Holy Spirit work within you, that you will be a faithful witness of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, let's thank God for all that he's done. Amen. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. Come on. It makes me want to shout. You just remain standing. We have Gabriel Price coming into the water this morning. And Gabriel has met with pastors this morning and he has expressed his faith in Jesus and the fact that he is committed to following Jesus. And so, Gabriel Price, this morning, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel, receive the grace and healing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the power of the Holy Spirit be with, at work within you that you will be a faithful witness of Jesus.